Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thanks so much for hanging out today. Today, my guest is Taylor Larson. And if you're not familiar with Taylor, Taylor is a producer, mixer, and audio engineer who has worked with artists like Asking Alexandria, Periphery, From First to Last, I See Stars, The Dangerous Summer, and so much more. He is also a co-founder of Mixwave, which is a really cool company working on making plugins and sample packs that sound incredible. And one of the things that really stood out to me when I was listening to all the examples of the Mixwave stuff is the quality of the drum sounds that Taylor gets. So that's why in this interview, we definitely dive deep into his drum process because he just has this way of getting really clear, punchy drums that have a lot of weight and impact and energy. And I think when you listen to his approach to how he gets them in this episode, I think you're going to definitely learn some new creative things. And he even shares some tips that kind of go against the grain, so to speak, of, you know, the rules of audio. And there's a, there are a lot of things that people say you should never do. But when you hear Taylor's approach to it and how it works, it makes sense. And it's definitely something that has made his drum sound incredible. And I think if you take some of these tips that he shares here, you can also make your drum sound wicked as well. So with that said, there's just so much good stuff in here. Let's just jump right into it. Taylor Larson, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. What's going on, man? Not much. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on. For people who might not know you or the kind of stuff you're working on these days and how you got into music and all that, can you give us that background on, you know, who you are, how you, why you got into music and all the cool stuff you're working on? Sure. Uh, it's kind of a long story, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to condense it and, and tell it the right way. So, um, I pretty much started out playing music. I mean, my dad gave me a guitar when I was like three or something. So I don't even remember learning guitar, actually. like It was just always there. (laughs) Yeah, one day I'm just like playing Blink-182 and like Nirvana (laughs) and Green Day and all that stuff. And I think like my dad and all his friends got a kick out of it. Like, look at this little kid's like playing these songs. (laughs) But it was just like bar chords or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and so I had always played music. I grew up around the DC area, uh, Silver Spring, Bethesda, that kind of area. And then when I was in going into like fifth grade, my mom decided she wanted to move to the Eastern shore to ocean city, which was kind of cool. Cause it's like surfer area. And what's crazy is like, there's, there's, scenes there so like here it's kind of different um at least nowadays but there it was like there was a bunch of kids that were kind of all into the same music and all into like skateboarding and then at some point there were shows and stuff like that it was a really cool way to grow up but it's funny like I remember when I went out there I, uh, my dad took me to this pizza place and this dude with like pink hair was working there. And I think, I can't remember if I was wearing like a shirt of a band, like a metal band or something. And he was like, oh, you should check out Poison the Well. Like they're metal and they kind of have that vibe. Like, all right. And this is before I moved out there. So like we went to a CD store and bought Tear from the Red and... I listened to that and then that kind of got me in this whole other wave of music. So I ended up moving out there. That guy's a senior when I'm a uh, freshman and then like, I end up being in bands with this guy and like, amazing. I don't know. Like for, for, first I went out there and I wanted to do the surf and skating kind of thing, but I had always played music. And then I kind of made a decision to like start a band and they had local shows there and they were awesome. Like they had all kinds of bands coming through there Um, and so we would get to play on those shows and it was really cool. And then I got more serious with it and I wanted to tour and I did, I I dropped out of 11th grade to, to go on a tour and pretty much tour that whole year. 
And uh, I had to come back in 12th grade because my mom was like, you have to graduate. So I had to like go through night school to make up 11th grade and 12th grade at the same time, which kind of sucked. But I had always like been in bands and I remember we uh, signed to this small indie label and I had been listening to this record, The Receiving End of Sirens. I don't know if you're familiar with that band, Um, but I was like obsessed with it. That was the first record where I was like, oh, wow, this snare drum sounds so cool to me. So I kind of went through and like figured out who did it. Oh, it was Matt Squire. And I went to our label and was I was like, I want to go record with Matt Squire. Well, at that point, he had just finished doing Panic at the Disco and, and the main and All Time Low, which is funny because we booked All Time Low to open our show in Ocean City for like 50 <laughs> bucks at the time, which is crazy. But um, yeah, and we played on Warp Tour with them. I remember we played this date that had like All Time Low, Cartel, had a bunch of cool bands on on the stage we played on um but anyways so we we told our label we want to work with Matt Squire i guess they reached out to him and they were like yeah no we're we're not going to pay for that but we found this other guy uh Paul Levitt so i was like well all right whatever like i'll go listen to the sound clips on his website and see and I was like, his snare sounds pretty cool. I mean, for me at that point, it was all about the snare. Like, I was obsessed with snares. Snare is like the hardest thing to to get right. So if if someone's got it right, then you can trust them. Yeah, it's it's like the one thing in a mix where it's like you could have an amazing mix with a bad snare, and the whole mix would just suck. You know, Saint Anger. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or even like, I'm a huge Feldman fan, or I was, and. I remember that used record, the second one he put out where the snare just sounds like a trash can. And I'm just like, huh, weird flex, but all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I went to Paul's to do a full length with my band at the time. And the band, after I quit, they changed their name. They were called Life on Repeat. They signed to Equal Vision after I quit. I ended up doing two records for them, two full lengths. Um, but we went to Paul's. And I remember just like seeing the Trident console, seeing like him mic the drums and do all the preamps and compressors and just being like, wow, I love this. Like I, I didn't expect it because I like I rehearsed. I had all my parts down. I was really excited to just like play really well and, and kind of, you know, create these awesome songs. And then I fell in love with the process during it. And I went home and I was just like, man, I don't really like touring. Like, I don't like sleeping in a van. I don't like sleeping at a random person's house that's probably haunted or something. <laughs> like, I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm not really cut out for that. I'm not like a road dog, if you will. I fell in love with recording and I was like, man, I could just do this and then I can still write. Because my favorite part of being in a band was writing like writing songs with my friends and like getting in that room. And it's like, all right, I'm going to play this. The drummer plays that. Here's a cool lead. Let's come up with something. And like, I love that part. And I figured out like, I can do this with anyone. I don't have to be in my band to do this. And it's amazing. So I, uh, I quit my band. They were really upset. And then I sold, I had like an orange amp, and some guitar gear, pedal board. I sold it all except for my guitar. And I went and bought like the first Intel MacBook that came out. I got that. I got Logic. I got like a Line 6 Tone port. And then I just started doing demos for my friends in like Ocean City, Maryland. Like, And I would save up and buy more gear as I went along. And eventually I decided I wanted to move down to Bethesda because I just felt like Ocean City it was like I don't know it's it's kind of like laid back out there it's it's not really a city vibe and there was kind of more going on down here and my grandmother lived here so I moved with her um I think around when I was like 20 and 
I just started saving, buying gear, saving, buying gear. Like literally any money I made, I would go buy a distressor. I would go buy a new mic and then I'd sell that mic and that distressor and buy a vintage 1176 and like just kind of accumulated more and more and and was just really obsessed. Like uh, it's weird. And I learned all the tough lessons that you learn, you know, recording. It's like I wanted to have secrets and and things like there were no podcasts like this there there was nothing and I was pretty close with Paul Levitt and but like he was like I'm not gonna really teach you anything to do with sound because you won't have your own sound then then you'll just sound like me and like what's the point in that and I remember I was like so bummed about it but then now I'm like that's the best thing anyone's ever done for me because I figured out my own way for everything. And I I think for anyone else, like that's so important. Um, I love teaching people. I love that you have a podcast that people that might not know as much can come and, and get some hacks or some little secrets that they can use. But I always tell people like, even when I give lessons or teach them, like take what I do, but then, kind of figure out like what you like about it. And maybe you can come up with something even cooler than what I came up with, you know? Well, the thing with it too, is that like, you can literally show someone the exact settings that you used. And unless they are working with the exact same tracks, it's going to sound different, right? Like, yeah, we all have our own interpretation of what sounds should sound like and, or what instruments should sound like. And so because of that, we just, you know, tweak things to our hearts content until our ears are happy. Right. But like, yeah, I mean, it, there's, I, I, I appreciate what Paul did for you by saying like, you know, I'm not going to focus on, on this, but yeah, I mean, he could have, he probably could have shown you it and you still would have probably got different, res, different results too. Right. Yeah. And it's weird. Like I've had people that worked for me in the past, like steal my sessions off my computer, like, and try to go out and do their own thing and use it. And I, I hear their work and I'm just like, there's some things that translate and and work, right? So there's like, you know, there's samples and things that you use for icing on the cake and it can be cool, but it's just like, it's not going to work. Like you can't just like, unless you took an amp sim, the exact one that I was using and then put the processing on. Cause it's like, I could have recorded guitars really dark and had a mixing chain that was super bright to kind of liven them up. And you could have recorded them bright. And if you put those settings on, it's going to sound course. terrible, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Back, back to the, the story. I, I came down here and I used to rent a room from Paul. And uh, I worked there. And then I, I hated driving to Baltimore. I hate Baltimore to begin with. Like, <laughs> the place sucks. Like, you park your car and someone's going to smash the window for no reason. Or, you know, because they wanted to steal something or whatever. But... Um, I was just like, man, I got to find something closer to my house. So I went on Google, looked for a place to rent. And two blocks from my house, there's this studio. It was called like a perfect sound or a perfect pitch or something like that. And I went in and it's like owned by this old hippie guy. And his wife is like the receptionist. And I'm like, hey, uh, I'm looking for a room to rent. And this guy was like so cool to me. Like he, I don't know, I guess he kind of felt like I was just a kid starting out. So he's like, you know what, I'll give you, I'll let you rent this room for like a thousand a month, which was great. And the room was insane. Um, And this studio was the studio that they did. I don't know if you're familiar with the company Bethesda Softworks. Have you heard of them? No, I haven't. So they do like... Lately, they did like Doom, but they did Fallout, the video game. They did Skyrim, um, a lot Watch of all the big video games. Really, yeah, a lot of really successful video games. Anyways, they did all that stuff here. Like they did all the voiceovers in this studio, and so I rented that space, and it was amazing. I did, uh, I did a record or a EP for a band, Sky Eats Airplane, there. And that kind of got me in the door. Um, another thing in parallel that was happening is my best friend that I grew up playing music with, he's a drummer. 
he was playing in a band called Periphery at the time. And so like, that's kind of how I met those guys. Um, and so I was hanging out with those guys a bunch. And then I was just kind of working my butt off here, just recording local bands and occasionally a bigger band here and there. And that was like the start of my career. And then um, the people that were renting this space, I mean, this place was like eight grand a month or something. Like it was insane. And at the time, like that was way more than what that is now. But um, they decided they wanted to move out. And I asked the uh, the people that were renting to them, would you still rent me this room for a thousand a month? And they pretty much just laughed at me. They were like, <laughs> well, you're a kid, so I don't, I don't really know about that. But uh, if you want the whole thing, you can have the whole thing. It's eight grand a month. And I was just like, dang, like I have to <laughs> pack up and leave. So I left. There was another studio that was like a hip hop studio. And I was like, man, this place is so shot. Like it is not nice at all. But I, I have to go here because I'm so booked up and like I, I don't have any place to record. So this place is kind of like it turned out to be like my sound city or something. Like it's like not a nice place, but the drum room sounded <laughs> so good. And like I moved in there and like one of the first things I did was Periphery 2, which is probably the record that kind of, I don't know, it, it I, I guess put me on the map, if you would say. And I did a lot of stuff that had a lot of success there. And I don't know why it did. There's just something special about that place. Um, I'd been there maybe 10 years and they wanted to double the rent. Like they, it got bought by somebody else. And I was like, nope. So <laughs> I left there and I went to my house. I built a studio in my house and it was really cool. And, uh, Long story short, we created this software company called Mixwave and we went to look for a facility to kind of have the headquarters and the original place that I went to that was two blocks from my house had not been touched in 10 years. So we got it. We're here. I'm right back where I started. Dude, that's so awesome. (laughs) Yeah, and this time we have the whole thing. So it's like... There's like five or seven live rooms, three control rooms, lounges, lobbies, all kinds of stuff. It's pretty epic. That's crazy, man. What a what a serendipitous thing to have happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Well, I mean, and definitely like in your story, it just sounds like, you know, one of the driving factors in your career has just been the fact that you've been so driven the whole way through. You pushed yourself to get into these places and, you know, you were willing to just sacrifice certain things just to to make it happen and so it's no question that like or no wonder why you've reached the status that you have because you know you've worked for it so man just kudos to that because i think there's a lot of people out there that would get get discouraged at some point along the way and probably give up right so i sacrificed everything at the start because i was essentially like i'm gonna leave my friends my band my whole community that i would lived you know, I lived there for 10 years and go to this city that like I've only been to like two or three times and just start over. And like at the time, like I don't want to get too deep into personal stuff, but I was going through a lot of anxiety and just like panic attacks and and crazy stuff with that. And I was I was just like, I'm going to change everything up. I'm going to go put myself in the most uncomfortable situation ever and see and like looking back anyone that that's listening to this like a lot of people thrive in uncomfortable situations like you don't realize it but it's like when you feel like you're lost or you're not you know at a place where you feel safe or home or whatever you get up every day and you go you're like I'm instead of being nervous I'm just gonna go do stuff to get rid of that feeling you know and that's kind of what happened with me but I didn't I'll say like in the beginning of my career, I worked my butt off until about the middle and then I burnt out. And that's another thing that like is so scary. And it's something that if I knew what I knew now going back, I would have maybe had more personal time or like space things out. I mean, when I first started, I would be doing two bands a day. Like I, I'd have a band come in, track drums, track guitars, 
they would go home at 7 p.m. and then the vocalist of a different band would come in and record. And it's fun when it, when you're doing it, but you get to a point where like I would like go to the bathroom in the middle of a session and then I'd walk out and then I would just stand in the hallway staring at a picture for like 20 minutes and not even <laughs> realize like, <laughs> oh, you got to get back down there and record, you know, like your brain just kind of like shuts off. Yeah. So that's something that's like super important is like anyone that loves it. It's like, yeah, you love it, but you got to pace yourself. It's tough. Of course. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely like, it, it's definitely a struggle to find that balance of like work life kind of thing. Right. And I think I agree with you. I think when you're younger, you have a little bit more leeway to like work your butt off and like maybe not as many financial responsibilities or whatever, you know what I mean? So it's like, if you have that opportunity, just go for it, you know, put your, if you, if you really, if you really want it, go for it and like build as fast of a name as possible for yourself. Um, Obviously, the later in the game you you get into this, the harder it would be to do that. But but it's still like it's still a lot of the same like work ethic of like, you know, you, you still have to work for it. You still have to put your best foot forward. You still have to do the best work. Um, and that's 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 always going to be the best calling card for you. You know, it's just like putting putting out a best like a great portfolio. The cool thing about it is like. I think doing all of that and cramming all of that in kind of developed my ears because there's this thing that happens where it's like you start and you have no clue what you're listening for or what you're doing. Like, I don't know why any of my earlier records sounded good. I ha- I don't know why. I mean, I know why now because I know what I'm doing more so, or I know how to get to where I want to be. But like back then I had no clue. I was just like hoping like, (laughs) and it's, it's so weird that like, like when I give lessons to people, I tell them like, just sit there with a two track of any song and just drag the EQ around and learn the frequencies. Because like when I mix now, I'll listen to a kick drum or I'll, I'll listen to a snare or whatever it is. And I can see in my head what kind of EQs I want. I'll, I'll be like, okay, I want a metric halo on this. I want to use this and kind of saturate that. And I know everything and how it's going to sound, all the curves of the different EQs and stuff. And when you get to that point, that's when you can really kind of go off of your gut instinct and let things flow and be fast and just kind of, I don't know, like it's it's so different. There there were so many years where I'm just like, man, how does this sound like this? Or, like I have no clue, you know? Do you feel like when you look back at your work that you'd, you'd mentioned like some of your earlier stuff you really enjoy when you listen back to it and you're wondering how it sounded good. Do you feel like there was like a lull in the middle where like at the beginning when you were so hungry, you were kind of just like critically listening and like maybe that's why you got the results you got. And then was there ever a period in the middle where you just got comfortable with the tools and didn't didn't learn? Like was that was that kind of part of your journey at all or have you always just been a learner? Yeah, I don't know if it's exactly that. So the thing that happened was this. When we did the Periphery record, they told, they showed me this Gojira mix, and it was like, uh, the record's called The Way of All Flesh. It was done by a dude named Logan Mater. And I remember hearing it, and I'm like, damn. Like, <laughs> I, I, okay, all right, we'll go for that. So later on, I'm going into the mixing side of things, and... It's the referencing that got me there. It's going back and forth. I'm like, all right, well, okay, let me listen to the kick. Let me listen to the snare. Let me listen to the balance. Let me listen to the mid-range of the guitars. And I don't know how I manipulated the things into being what they were, but it was like, okay, cool, I can get the snare where theirs is. And you kind of learn energy. Like for me, mixing, it's all energy. It's like, can I get something to hit me with as much energy as this has. And then when you go back and forth, the tones don't seem to matter quite as much. It's like, oh, is my snare hitting, you know, with the power that theirs is hitting and and just the overall presentation of it. Um, And that's kind of what got me there is just referencing things. And then I started taking things where it was like, oh, well, I really like this guy's kick drum, but I don't like the rest of his mix. And I really like this guy's overhead sound. And so I started referencing all those other things. 
And then I got to a point where I started referencing my own stuff. Like I was like, man, I really nailed it on this one. Let me see if I can beat that. And I'm just super competitive. Like I know it's unhealthy, but I'm I'm always like, I have to beat whatever I listen to. It has to be louder, more powerful, more crazy. Like, I don't know. That's just my nature, I guess you would say. <laughs> that's cool. But yeah, I mean... Man, I, I could totally hear that in your mixes. Like they do have a lot of energy to them, and uh, and you you made mention to the snare multiple times so far, and that's definitely something I wanted to ask you about. You know, in terms of like your drum sounds, like you definitely have to me really energetic drums that that hit you hard, and especially when it comes to like the snare, um, I feel like you've got this like amazing talent of getting your snares to have a lot of smack and a lot of weight, and they that energy is there. It, like bump like comes out of the speaker and hits you in the face kind of thing. So, so with that said, like what, what is your secret for snares? Like what are you, what's your normal approach when it comes to mixing snares? Where do, where do you start with it? Well, drums in general, like, I don't know if it was Paul that told me this or if it was Matt or Brian, it was one of the three. It might've been Brian and maybe Matt, but they were like, dude, you have to learn how to make drums sound good without triggers. Like that's the biggest thing. And so I started putting a ton of emphasis on like learning what drums sound good. Like, like I don't like wood snares. Like I can't record a wood snare and get it to do the thing that I like. Like it, they always sound dry and they always get eaten up by everything else in the mix. So I kind of through trial and error learned that, okay, I like the the Black Beauty or the Bell Brass, which is, I mean, everyone else likes those. There's no secret there. But it was mainly trying to learn how to get them to sound a certain way um, without relying on triggers. And then kind of after I felt like I could get drums to sound good right off the bat, then I brought the triggers in and then I kind of understood it. But like hearing that from one of those guys was probably the biggest thing for me. And then in terms of snare, I remember, so I was really good friends with this dude, Brandon Paddock. I still am to this day. And he was working for John Feldman and he wanted to quit and he wanted to give me the opportunity to come take his job. So I flew out to LA and I went to Feldman's and like Brandon was already a fan of my records before that. Like I had already done periphery. I had done my old band life on repeat, which the album at the time sounded pretty cool. And I flew out there and I remember watching Feldman and I saw what he was doing with these knees. Like, like he, so I would just like kind of dial in my preamps before and then run them wide open. And that was cool. I saw this dude was cranking the input, but bringing the output fader down to distort the preamp. I'm like, whoa, that that was like blowing my mind at the (laughs) time. And I remember getting home and trying that. And it was like, okay, you can get your snare to sound like a trigger or something like just by doing that. And then I started doing that mixing too. I was like, all right, what's going to happen if I take this SSL strip and do the same thing? or, you know, this Neve clone or whatever. And that's what kind of makes that main snare that kind of leads the pack of all the samples that are under it and the bottom snare and all that. It it just makes it jump out to the front. And I think it's probably to do with harmonics, overdrive, saturation, you know? Totally. It's kind of funny because like, not it sounds like you didn't go to audio school, but like that's one of the things that you you first learn about when it comes to gain staging is like don't hit the red with your yeah. preamps because it's preamps like red red is bad, you know? And so like you just shy away from it. And then when you actually see it done right for the first time, it's like mind blowing, you know, because <laughs> it's just like it opens up a whole new world of sounds and um yeah, definitely like snare distorted snare can sound really cool and have that fatness to it that you can't get otherwise. You know, you just get that like kind of ticky sound if you go too too little yeah. on the on the preamp, right? I call it the PVC bucket. It sounds like you're hitting a PVC bucket with a stick. You know, it doesn't have any weight. It doesn't sound like a snare to me. But what's crazy is like 
that's the sound we love because we grew up with that. So like you think about like I got multi tracks a while ago from Queen, the song Killer Queen by Queen. And I'm like listening to the drums and I'm like, they totally did the same thing on whatever console they did. So it's like, I mean, you think about all the Sound City stuff, Nirvana and all that, that they're probably just overdriving the Neves. That's the sound. And so I think that's just what our ears love. And all the guys that are at the top, like you look at the Chris Lord Algies and all the other mixers that are crushing it, they all break the rules. That's we like the rules to be broken. That's the sound we like, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, it, in a way, it's kind of like, you know, when you look back at, you were saying, when you look back at your previous catalog, how like your earlier recordings sounded a certain way, it, there might've been things that you were doing back then that were technically wrong. That might've been right. Like for the sound, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I think that's one of the things too. Sometimes like you learn the rules and then it like sticks in your head that you can't do these things. And like you, you don't realize you can break the rules. Yeah, that's, I mean, for all your listeners, that's the big issue is like when people ask me things, I'm like, look, you can try this out, but you don't have to live by it. Or can I do this or that? I'm like, you could do anything you want. The the funniest thing that happened to me, um, I think it was Matt from Periphery. I was, I was recording his drums and I look in and he hit the snare mic. It was like, pointed the other way or something it was completely screwed up i'm like well i didn't hear it in the track when i was tracking let me compare so uh he started the song it was fine i knew by the end it was messed up and i went and i listened and i was like it doesn't matter like i used (laughs) to think if somebody bumped a mic like on the drums it would matter it doesn't matter like it literally doesn't matter i got to a point where i would do drums and I would tell the drummer, pick any mics you want and, and I'll put them on the toms and mix them for you. Like, you know, you just get bored and you like the challenge of making things sound cool. But there's so many things that don't matter. And another thing I learned that I personally like is you. He- there's two types of records out there. You get records where every song tonally sounds exactly the same and the record feels like one li- long song. And then you get records where they may have recorded songs on different occasions with different instruments. And like, to me, that's what I like. I don't want every song to sound the same. I want it to feel like a movie or something. I like the scene change. I even mix that way. I try to like make verses feel real different and automate different rooms or just whatever. Because I think the human ear gets bored when it's just the same thing the whole time, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and it, it's just like all of these experiments that you do or all of these different changes that you make within a mix, at the end of the day, they are making you a stronger mixer because you've you've now had the, that experience. It's, it's not like you're just working with one sound all the time. You're learning. Yeah. You're learning, like you're expanding your color palette, so to speak, you know? Um, yeah. And that just allows you to go back whenever you need that, those kind of sounds. You you have that experience to know how to get it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so we were talking about the snare and you were talking about how like the Feldman trick is to just like kind of drive the preamp. Um, and, and when you get, when you do that, you know, is it just that you're getting a fatter sounding drum or, or are you getting, cause one of the things that I noticed with your snares in particular is that they have a lot of attack and like the, they just, they bite. So like, are you getting that because of cranking the preamp or is it more of the body that you're getting because of cranking the preamp? So there's a lot of different things that go into it. So like, Usually when I have a band that comes in, I'm like, all right, do you want the crack snare or do you want the thud snare? And for me, the difference is like the crack snare is like Green Day American Idiot or or like the Dave Matthews song that CLA mixed. It's like really snappy and kind of maybe even a little bit ringy. It's it's really cool. And then the thud snare is kind of like more so what you'd hear on like Nickelback or like Paramore Riot, you know, that really kind of hits you in the chest and almost is like pillowy, thuddy, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've kind of, I think I started at the thud snare, like where I was more into that. And to me, that was like kind of more like that receiving end of sirens sounding snares, more soft, but still punches you. It's just in a different spot. And then I kind of learned both. And so like if a band 
tells me like I want a really snappy snare, well then we have to tune it different and I'm going to EQ it different. And then if we want to go for the other one, I'll like in the mix, like I'll, I'll literally scoop like 3K to kind of pull out whatever those offensive frequencies are. It might still be a snappy snare like going in, but it's just depends on what snare it is, you know? And like for me, audio is just manipulation. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's like just kind of getting that saturation and EQ to make it do the thing that you want it to do, you know? And I never compress snares. I always feel like that makes them sound smaller. So like usually it's only just overdrive and EQ on snares for me. Crazy. I, I would have assumed that you were adding like a lot of compression, like parallel compression or something like that. Cause there is such that so much attack to them that I thought maybe that was something that was a, I do. So I do parallel compression on the whole bus. So like drums as a whole go to a parallel compressor and then a dry. And it's the same exact thing that goes to both. I know some people do really crazy stuff where they're, the symbols are going here, but the toms are going here. Like, I don't, I don't like that. I like to keep it more simple, but I do parallel compression in that regard, but it doesn't really have anything to do with what I do on like the actual track itself. Gotcha. If that makes gotcha. sense. Yep. So then as far as like getting the drum sounds it, to, to you, is it more important to get the tuning of the drum right than it is to like have EQ or is it the other way or is it a little bit both? It's weird because I, I want to say that that matters so much. Right. And it's like, I think, the player matters the most because again, I've had songs where like the snare dropped, like, you know, I don't know, five semitones or something like in a song, like it, it starts somewhere and it ends somewhere else. And you're like, man, it's, it's a really good take. Like, can I get away with this? And you kind of can, if you know what you're doing with mixing, but I think the snare is a really important thing. I think the guy playing it is equally, if not more important. The room is important. And then like everything after, if you have a great mixer, they're going to be able to make it awesome no matter what, if it fell out of tune, whatever, you know? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree that the drummer really does make a big difference. And I remember one of my first mentors, he he told me like the very first thing you should do whenever you record a drummer is just watch them play and see where they hit the drum, you know? And he, he told me like, you know, he, he would frequently just reposition snare drums so that they would, people would hit it in the center because they were hitting it off to the side or that kind of thing, you know? And he's like, yeah, that's how I got that attack that I wanted, you know? It's like moving stuff around. And, and I guess there's some truth to that, um, you know, because people's playing definitely does make a big difference in terms of the sound you're going to get out of them, right? And the problem, like, so the one thing I do that's so different from Brian and Paul, and I, I envy Brian for this, like, I love that he can just take any band and make them work to like get a record. And and a lot of times those records were iconic. I mean, they're, they're definitely records that I grew up listening to, but I don't have that patience. So like I'll get a band in that's paying me thousands of dollars and it's like, you can't play your part like in, or, or you can't hit the drums the right way. And it's like, okay, you could do this live. That's cool. But we got to get a session guy. Like for me to have the sound that I want to give you, if it, because here's the thing, like, let's say they pay that money. He plays bad. And then it sounds bad. It's like, well, you're not getting what you paid for. So I need to be able to get you that sound. My thing is, I don't care who plays on the record. Like, I don't care if the bass player tracks the rhythm guitar or the guitar player plays the bass whatever sounds the best, whoever can pick it hard and give that attitude and that character. That's all I care about. Um, Because to me, the studio is such a different thing. Like, like it's like when I hear Paul's records, to me, it sounds very close to like what you would see live. If you saw a band performing live for me, I like the ear candy. Like I grew up listening to Feldman stuff with the used and all this and that, where it has all kinds of, programming and just things that make it feel like a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, I like that. And I don't know. I think, I think you can have whoever do whatever. There should be no ego. There should be like anyone's idea is a good idea. If it's a good idea. 
And at the end of the day, as a band, you have to learn how to recreate that live. And that's not really my problem, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, you're right. Like, if a band wants a specific sound and they can't perform it that way in the studio, but maybe there's a better guitar player in the band who can make it happen, you know? Like, why make only half the guitars sound good when, you know, just have that person play on all the guitars? Yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. It's like, at the end of the day, the studio sound, like the record is going to sound a certain way because of what went into it. So whoever played it, how, however that happened, like whatever, as long as you get the great result, that's all that matters. The problem with me is I just don't have the patience. So like I, I've watched Paul and like he has this method that's so cool because it's like he can sit there and track whoever and it's like he he used to take like 20 takes of each part and then he would just comp them all together. But like to me, you remove all of your... I don't know. Is it drive? I don't know what it is. It's that, that vibe of like hearing, like for me, I love to hear everything done as it's happening. So like, that's why I always bought like a crazy pro tools rig. Cause I want to run the plugins while we're recording. Cause I want to hear things sounding good as they're happening. I don't like to fill my plate and then see what I can turn it into later. I like to build something and have it like when we're done tracking, it almost sounds like it's done type of thing. And I feel like when you do that, the bands react to that. They're like, holy shit, this sounds amazing. Like everybody's kind of feeding off that energy. And when it's like, if I'm going to be sitting here like bummed out that you can't play your part, that you should have rehearsed, that you spent a bunch of money with me, like it's not going to be good. Like I just, I want energy, you know? For sure. Yeah, there's definitely truth to that because like, it's so demotivating to a band when they're listening back to their recordings and they sound weak and you're like, Oh, don't worry. It'll sound better in the mix. And it's like, will it like the, you know, the band yeah. doesn't know that. So they, yeah. they, there is some truth to the fact that like people do want to hear it kind of sounding finished right off the bat. And it should be because ultimately if you're, if you're producing and, and recording everything all the way through, then like you want, you kind of have this vision in mind of what the end result is supposed to sound like. So why not just get that right at the beginning? And and know that you're done, and everyone everyone is excited about it throughout the whole process. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. What about for um, when it comes to drums again? Like, what about for ambience? Like, how do you go about typically adding like ambience? Like, do you have any go to reverbs that you like to use, or how do you get that that size out of your drums? So two things. One, I gate the snares pretty tight, and to fix that so that there's actually some sort of sustain, I use a really tight, small reverb on the snare. Something that sounds kind of cheesy in 80s, I guess you would say. But I bring it up just a little bit to kind of make it ring as long as the snare would without the gate type of deal. So that's the first thing. And you can kind of get the whole mix going and bring that up and down and kind of find where that makes the snare snare feel like it's kind of right. And yeah. then secondly, but you're working with a cleaner track because you've gated it. So you're not getting all that cymbal bleed and all that other stuff going into the reverb. Yeah. We'll, we'll do crazy stuff. We'll, we'll gate that. We'll put ghost notes on a different track and treat them completely different. Cause you get a lot of bands where they want those ghost notes to be like loud and heard. So all, I mean, I've even had records where I had my assistant chop them and fade each single one. So it's like just doing the gating by hand, I guess you would say. Um, it just depends on the band and, and what you're trying to achieve. So are you, are you saying you, you gate ghost notes as well? Or is it just the loud hits? Like, okay, imagine you have a snare track and all the ghost notes you've taken off that track and dragged them onto a separate track. Gotcha, okay. yeah. That and then sense. you chop those and fade each one out to to the point where you can get the most sustain out of it, but you're not getting the cymbal bleed. Gotcha. It's pretty crazy. I, I remember uh I remember reading something about uh who's that producer that uh Shania Twain worked with? He's like legendary. Mutt Lang? Mutt Lang, yeah. It's her husband for a while. Yeah, I, I remember like reading something that he would go and have his engineer chop every S and like automate it down. So he never had to use a DSer. He just turned the S's down. It's like so much work, but if you think about it, it's amazing because it's like you're pulling that sibilance back, but you still have the clarity of everything, you know? And so that 
it was kind of just like that workflow of like, all right, well, let's let's by hand treat every individual ghost note. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, I wouldn't do that today, but I've done it in the past, depending on the band and, and what they're trying to achieve. Um, but I do that reverb, and that's kind of like my tight, up-close sounding snare. And then to add to that, I remember when we were recording with Paul when I was doing my full length with him when I was like a teenager and he was showing me because I was like, man, like I really like a long decay on the snare or not long, but just like something roomy sounding. And he was showing me, he's like, check out the stairwell. Like I have these two mics in here. (laughs) And so for me, I had always done that just because I saw him do it. And at my spot, the second studio I had, there was a little hallway that you could close the door and it was a cheap door. So like the drums would still come through it, but it like some of the high end of the cymbals would get filtered out. So like I would put a stereo set of hall mics in there and that would be the ambience of my drums. So I would have them close mic in their room and then I'd have that hall for the ambient. I love it. Yeah. That, that's like, even like a like a home studio, you can get away with so much of that kind of stuff where you just like put a mic in a different room or that kind of thing. And you can get some really cool tones off of it. So I love that that's yeah. your approach to it. it. It definitely can make a small room sound a lot bigger, you know, because you're, you're just utilizing other spaces and not making it just all that one small room. I mean, I, I actually prefer a smaller drum room that's kind of medium treated because I think the drums are just tight and punchy. And then having a hall make it seem like it's a bigger room versus the drums just being in a loud, live, boomy room, you know? Because you have the mics on the snare and they pick up so much cymbals when it's a big, bright room, you know? Yeah, it can definitely be a lot more uncontrollable when you have that bigger room because, yeah, everything is being excited and you have all this space. And, you know, often, you know, these bigger drum rooms, they have like really long reverb time. So if you're working with a faster tempo song, that might not work for you. It it could just end up making things sound a lot more muddy and cluttered, right? Yeah. That was another thing that I kind of observed at Feldman's because I I would go to Paul's and Brian's and they had these big live rooms that were just like massive and like epic sounding. And, and I remember like I've, I've recorded in, in Paul's old live room and I would be like, man, I cannot get the hi-hat out of the snare or like just stuff that everyone deals with. But then I went to Feldman's and I'm like, this is way more dead and treated. I mean, it's not a small room. It's still like pretty spacious, but it just had more fiberglass in it and more treatment. And it was just more focused sounding. And I was like, oh, (laughs) I guess you don't have to have that, you know, and, and a lot of it is like finding out what you love, you know? So like for me, that's, that's where I feel like I can get things the best, but I'm not opposed to anything. I mean, give me whatever, you know? Yeah, for sure. Then in terms of um, like you mentioned samples earlier and how, I mean, you generally focus on getting a great drum sound up front, but then are you ever adding samples after the fact um, whether it's for, for room sounds or for actually close mic room or samples? Yeah, and I think, so like I used to have this stigma of like, oh, you can't use samples or, oh, you have to use them like really low or they have to be multi-sampled or this or that. Um, I think as soon as I started mixing, because my career started with me doing records myself and mixing my own records. So like it's, it was easier for me to kind of take the stuff I recorded and mix. But then I started mixing for other people and you would get tracks and they would just be engineered so bad. You're just like, Oh, like this sounds awful. (laughs) So at that point, my, my assistant and I, it was like, all right, well let's start taking our own triggers and let's just multi-sample and replace this whole thing. Cause it's not usable. And that kind of warmed me up to the idea of using triggers in a in a way that I didn't before. So like the first way I started was I would just use one shots on the kick and snare and that was it. I wouldn't add anything to the toms. I wouldn't do anything other than that. Um, one little trick that I learned from Feldman's guy was you can take the kick snare MIDI and send it to like superior 
mute everything but the room mics and blend their room mics with yours. That's that's kind of a cool mm. thing. So yeah, that's a cool trick for getting that bigger room sound when you don't have it. Yeah, I would I would take my hallway and then I would blend that. But then now I'm to a point where I'll use the one shots. If it's something I'm mixing and their snare is not good, I will I will completely multi sample replace it. And I've fallen in love with multi sample room replacement because you can get all of the symbols out. So it's like I could take the actual room mic and I could take the same thing multi sampled with no symbols and kind of just play with the faders where it's like you got to have the real one because that that kind of glues everything and makes it gel and and some of that bleed is cool in a way. And but then you can kind of extend that decay with the other one and kind of find that balance. So I'll do whatever now. I don't care. I'm not like, oh, I can't use samples or something. Like I, I grew up like that, and but now I'm just like, I'll do whatever it takes to make it sound good. And I think another thing too is like if you hear like I remember I heard uh this Bring Me the Horizon mix that David Bendith did. And even Riot, if you listen to Riot, and you're like, dude, that's just the same hit over and over again. And it's <laughs> like the rolls sound like machine guns. And I used to like think that was so lame and like make fun of it and talk shit on it. And it's like now when I hear it, I'm like, people love it. Who cares? <laughs> like, do you think anyone listening to Riot, which is like their biggest record, gives a shit that it's the same sample? Like, I don't think there's any right or wrong in making records. Like the only people that are noticing that are the engineers who are trying to figure out how to get that drum sound. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like this dude just did the cheapest, fastest, easiest way the, the with the least amount of integrity, and it's amazing, and people love it. <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, you're right, though. Like, sometimes I, like, I, I've always leaned on samples f- for a similar reason, where it's like sometimes that, having that one shot in there just adds a level of consistency to the track, which can be nice, right? And if you blend that in with a natural sound, you're still going to get some sort of dynamics to it because the natural sound is still adding that. But if you have a drummer who's kind of weak and isn't really hitting things hard or or very consistent, then having a sample under that just really does give you that energy and impact still. But, you know, you don't have to replace a drummer, I guess. I have two two thoughts on it. So the first thought is that everybody loves to use the word dynamic, right? Everyone, oh, I love dynamics. Oh, this is beautiful and dynamic. No one likes dynamics. If you look <laughs> at a master, it literally looks like a stick of butter or something. It's like hard cut. And, and like when you hear drums, when I hear the dynamic change, unless it's like, you know, a bridge and they're building something or whatever it may be. I don't want to hear the dynamic change. I want it to feel consistent. Feeling consistent is amazing. That's what makes you like want to nod your head or dance is because you're feeling the kick hit you in a certain way and it's staying consistent. Now there can be phrases and things that happen in between that, but I don't know. I always thought it was funny. Like I, I grew up reading gear space and like everybody was talking, Oh, dynamics and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, dude, no one likes dynamics you just don't know that that's what it's called, you know? (laughs) It's true. It's like back in the eighties, like when you had all these power ballads, maybe dynamics were a little bit more of a thing then because there was so much space between notes and everything. But like, yeah, if you're working on heavier rock stuff, it's like you want it intense. You want it in your face. You don't want to be losing the snare every couple hits because the drummer hit it a little bit loose, you know, like, but even, even Michael Jackson, like that's all drum machine. And when they do, it's funny. I was I was just watching on YouTube the other day. They like showed the stems for one of his songs, and I'm like, "Damn!" Like they're they're doubling the bass guitar with MIDI bass or synth bass, and the drums are like 90 percent electronic. So it's like there might be a player, but they're not really leaning on that. And that's in pop music. I mean, in pop music, it mm-hmm. makes more sense. But like, that's why people love it because it just feels consistent we love consistency you know um so that that's my first thought when you mentioned the one shots in the second is i think one shots are really cool where you take the frequencies that your ears hear where they're more sensitive and you can let 
the real drums live in those frequencies. And then like, like, so, so for example, on a kick drum, I really love triggering the outside kick because it's just low end. You're Mm -hmm. not hearing the click of it. So if I take the click from the real mic and I take the low end from the fake one, you're never going to be able to tell that that's fake because where your ears hear more sensitively, you're hearing it differ between the hits, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my theory with one shots. It's like you can either blend them at a low volume or you can blend them in a way where they're not up in that top end area too much where it sounds like a machine gun, you know? For sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, One thing I meant to ask you when we were talking about how you saturate the preamps a little bit, do you find that you ever use like any sort of clipping in post? Like when you're mixing, do you ever add any additional clipping to it? Or um, I know you said you don't usually use compression, but. Yeah, it was never like, I never really knew it was that until this kind of fad where everyone had these like clipping plugins. Oh, here's a clipper or whatever. I, I was just doing it like on the SSL, like, channel strip and waves or whatever it may be like they have some better ones now um now what i do is so i started a a software company and we have this germanium pedal made by benson which is an amp manufacturer and it's it's a guitar pedal and it was intended to germanium's kind of like a low mid sounding harmonically rich totally unpredictable sound and like he made that in a pedal and I thought, man, that'd be so cool to try that on drums. So I've been like driving that pedal and just kind of like bringing the output back. And that's kind of my last thing in the signal chain. I love it. Yeah, that's cool. I was actually, when I was checking out the mixed wave website, I saw that you had some examples. I was like, Oh, it's a guitar sim. And then, you know, I, I, I saw you had all these drum examples. I was like, Oh, that's, that's a cool approach to this. Like very, very interesting something you don't see a lot of right so it's very cool yeah and so just just to talk about my company so before we got on here yeah you you were telling me how you created this thing for a lot of the people that might not have access to things and the people that are are doing it at home and that really resonated with me because that's pretty much the exact reason i started the software company there's two reasons. There's there's a negative reason. There's a positive. The positive reason is I can take everything I'm doing and try to build it into something where anyone else can take those sounds and then they could just write a song and be done with it. Like my goal is for, let's say you have a kid in a bedroom that's super talented. He's going to write the next hit or he's going to write something that that, you know, is incredible and he knows nothing about mixing or recording, well, here you go. Take my stuff. You can have things to click through, whatever it may be. And it's like a vehicle. Because I I don't think people, I mean, it's where it's going anyway. Like, people are, are trying to do stuff in their bedroom. And, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people write, and there's a lot of big music that comes out of someone's bedroom at some point. And... I just wanted to give them tools where it was like, oh, wow, this sounds like like something I could hear on the radio or just something really like polished, but I'm just sitting here programming it like with MIDI blocks and I could just track to it. I don't have to be good at anything and I can put something out. I think that's kind of a really liberating thing in the audio world. And if you talked to me five years ago, 10 years ago, I, I would have been like, no way, like never. I would never do that. But Um, something just clicked for me. And the second reason was that I think music that comes out nowadays is so bad that this is like my way of making albums. It's making software. Cause it's like, I don't like any of this mumble rap trap music. I don't really. And and like, I've always been into like pop music and, and hits and like things that are kind of popular. And I've always thought like, oh, I can see why this song's great. Or, you know, I've always just been a fan of songs. And nowadays when I hear stuff that comes out, I'm just like, I don't even want to be a part of this right now. So <laughs> I was like, instead of making records, I'm I'm just going to take a little hiatus and I'm going to make software because I can still be really passionate and like do something that I'm proud of. Whereas 
it's like with music, I'm there's certain things that integrity wise, I'm just not willing to do, you know? Fair. Yeah. Well, definitely like, so for, for people who are listening to this, who aren't familiar with Mixwave, like it, you guys are a sample and plugin based company, right? Is that how you yep. describe yourself? Yeah. And, yeah. and you guys offer drum samples and guitar packs and that kind of stuff. So for like anyone who uses these tools, like it's such a quick way to get started with your projects and to get good sounds. If you don't have the ability to mic up drums in your house or whatever, like these samples are going to get you great results right away. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's really cool that what you're doing there. And man, I, I was listening to like a bunch of the the packs that you've got out there for all the drum stuff. Like you get some amazing sounds and you get some big drummers that have offered their sounds to it too. So, you know, I think it's just a really cool platform that you've built and uh, like, you know, I know we spent a lot of time here talking about drums, but like that's a big part of your company. And, and when you listen to the samples that you're offering, like they sound incredible. So, you know, it kind of makes sense that you would focus on some drum stuff, drum stuff there. Right. Yeah. It's I wanted to take everything that I kind of held close to the chest, all the secrets, and then just build it in and put it out there. And like another thing, too, is like I'm mixing for all these other drummers as well. And, and we're getting things where everyone's happy and everybody you know, has a specific sound that they want to have, but it's, it, you can reverse engineer the whole thing. Like you can literally click a button and then you'll have all the raw drums off the mics and you can build them yourself if that's what you want to do. I just, I just wanted to like kind of cover both bases. And not only that, there's a button that has like the one shots, like we, we spoke about that you can add those in or take those out if you want as well. So we have a lot of cool stuff coming up. Um, a lot of drummers where I'm just in there recording them thinking like, how am I in the same room with this drummer right now? This is <laughs> surreal. Just people I kind of grew up idolizing and, and we have a lot of that coming out, a lot of really cool amp stuff, but a lot of mixing tools as well. There's probably about 20 plugins in the works right now. So that's amazing, man. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, like like I said, like they, you know, I was checking out all the samples yesterday and they, they all just sound incredible. And the fact that you've got like, you know, Tony, Tony Royster and Lou Holland and like all these other guys making these sample packs with you. Like these are big drummers out there right now. So it's like you get these people sound. It's like having that guy play session drums for you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty and Luke, cool. Luke Holland is a, a co-owner in the company as well. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I created it with him in... Um, somebody that I would consider a mentor uh, that owns a lot of other influential record labels and, and companies and someone that I was very close with. So we all kind of, I went to this, this guy, Jeff, and I said, can we start this? And he said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so that's awesome. We, we did it. Very cool, man. Well, yeah, everyone listening, like definitely make sure to check out the Mixwave stuff. And uh, yeah, Taylor, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but like if people want to learn more about you and the kind of projects you're working on or Mixwave and or maybe even want to work with you, like what, what's the best place for them to do that? I would say Instagram. Don't email me because my email is flooded and I don't want any more emails. But Instagram is is cool to connect. Uh, go on the mix Mixwave Instagram as well. Um Check out the Mixwave website. I don't run either of those, but I always look at what's going on. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely include the links in the show notes as well so people have that too. Awesome. But I'm in. Well, dude, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this. I really appreciate it. Sure. No problem. So that was my interview with Taylor Larson, and that was awesome. I loved hearing about his process for getting great drum sounds, and his drums definitely sound incredible. They definitely have a lot of energy and a lot of impact to them, so it was cool to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit and hear a little bit more about his process, and it was also very interesting to hear kind of the the tips that he learned from working with John Feldman, because for me personally, John Feldman is an engineer who I definitely admire, and uh, I also grew up listening to a lot of those records, and so to have someone who was able to sit in the studio with him and kind of see how he got his drum sounds, it was really cool to hear some of those tips and, and that process, so definitely very cool, and I love that part of the reason why those drums sound great, whether it's Taylor's tracks or, or John Feldman's tracks, is because of overdriving preamps because that's just something that you know we're constantly taught you shouldn't do this you should never distort your tracks but 
sometimes you got to break the rules to get the right sounds. And uh, I think that that's a really good example of a couple guys who are doing it and absolutely crushing it. And if it sounds good, it is good. That is the golden rule of audio. And uh, sometimes you just need to learn how you can manipulate sound and how to do the wrong, quote unquote, wrong things to get the right sound. So it was definitely cool to hear all of that stuff from Taylor and to learn all that kind of stuff. And I hope that you found this episode valuable. I definitely know that I did. And I hope that you were able to take away a lot of great tidbits here because there was a lot. So definitely make sure to implement some of this stuff into your tracks next time you work on your drums. And as usual, if you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, definitely make sure to do that. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. And make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. There's lots of great resources on that website designed to help you learn to record and edit and mix your music much more confidently with speed and get pro results because this is absolutely possible from home and on the website there are a ton of great resources there to help make this achievable for you and to help you make sense of the entire process and one resource that you definitely want to check out while you're there is called the mixing mindset and that is a book where i break down step by step the entire mixing process showing you what you should be listening for, how you should be using the tools, and how to get the sounds that you hear in your head to come out of your speakers. So once again, check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and that's available at MasterYourMix.com. So that's it for this episode, guys. We've reached the end. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end, and I look forward to chatting with you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.